thank you very much for the invitation, for giving me the honor to be with you tonight, this very special night, this very special week, on the occasion of the anniversary. And uh, in the next uh, hour, a bit less perhaps, we will learn quite a lot concerning a mechanism that we call the oldest known computer. Probably it was an astronomical clock, as we will see. And uh, in this beautiful simulation that you can fa have, in fact, uh, even as an application to your telephone, <laughs> yes, by Mr. Asimakopoulos, a student, and uh, his professor, Rumeliotis. It is a very intriguing instrument that I have been uh, mesmerized with since I was a pupil, probably 12 or 14 years. Well, here we have a copy, made a model made of bronze. It follows our results, our research results. Uh, it is really like a clock. Of course, it was probably on a sort of stand, and below it we can imagine a pair, at least, of weights and counterweights, and something new or peculiar, a float inside a cylindrical or prismatic, anyway, container of water, where the water goes in at a constant rate, makes the cork, as we read in ancient books, to go up, and this makes the clock work. Of course, all I have to add that all the other members of our group do not accept the view that this was a clock. But we will see why we go to this at least working hypothesis, if not conclusion. And the reason is that in very many ancient texts, we have very detailed description on how these type of instruments have been functioning with these weights and counterweights. This is the reason. So let's go now to our presentation. And uh, we have prepared it, of course, especially for tonight. And we'll see that uh, it fits well with Jeremiah Horrocks as well series of lectures because he was, he is famous for measuring exactly, for the first time, the ellipticity, the elliptical trajectory of the moon. And in fact, uh, this mechanism, as we will see, gives motion to the moon. Here is the pointer of the moon. How, somewhere here we have the Earth. And the Earth goes around, excuse me, the Moon goes around the Earth with a variable velocity, possibly in an elliptical trajectory, but this is really, or quasi-elliptical, but this is secondary. Everybody accepts that it is a trajectory that follows at least Kepler's second law. Fast when it is very close to the Earth at perigee and slower at the apogee, and so on. And there is another aspect that relates the mechanism with Horrocks. This is Venus. Well, in this mechanism, we have uh, an eight-year periodicity of Venus which is related to the Olympic game periodicity that is four years, 
which exists in the mechanism and if we take into account the motion of Venus, Earth, the Sun of course, and the Moon, we have an eight year period which is inside this mechanism. And this was a very ancient calendar, probably prehistoric, that continues to be important at the time of uh, this mechanism. A mechanism that has been probably constructed around 150 to 100 BC. And it's the time to thank all the organizers and uh, of course the members of our team that we will see in a while and all the people that uh, contributed to what we have tonight the opportunity to present. This is the initial team, sort of, with Mike Endmus from the University of uh, Wales and Tony Fries that was at that time with him, and then John Siradakis, professor at the University of Thessaloniki, and Yanis uh, and myself from Athens and many more people uh, with a very, um, very strong um, percentage of our team from the UK, like for example, all these t people that are the ones that contributed with their instruments to our study that we did with computer tomographies, we obtained 5,000 x-rays of every single piece of the mechanism and then we combine them together with appropriate mathematics and we know the density inside. Very briefly, what is the mechanism? We already said that it is an astronomical dedicated computer, we could say. And it has, as we saw before in the simulation, several pointers. We have the moon and the sun. The moon changes phases during the month. And as we said, it changes velocity as well, from perigee to apogee and back. We have a solar calendar here with 365 days. And also, every four years, they add an extra day to keep a proper calendar as we do today. And the other side has the eclipses, lunar and solar, with a periodicity of the order of 18 years and an even better of 54 years. In a spiral scale, which is a simple Archimedes spiral for those of us that uh, love mathematics. And at the top, we have a few more calendars that are related to the phase of the moon. In fact, this particular one that is again in a spiral scale is the calendar we use today for Easter. It has been refined, I believe, at the time of Socrates by Meton so it carries Meton's name. And we have the eight-year calendar of the Olympic Games. Of course, we learn that it is a four-year period. It is. But one four-year period is 49 months, lunar months, and the next one is 50, and so on. And this again, this eight-year period, is a calendar that humans have been using, I believe, almost from prehistoric times. We have some indications. So this is the mechanism that we know, but uh, because we have uh, the manual of the instrument written with very beautiful capital letters, uh, Greek letters, of course, exactly the ones that uh, you know, We read there all the details concerning the planets, the motion of the planets. So we believe that it had the planets as well. And for this, 
we have an extra gear that we don't know where exactly fits, but because it is a gear inside a hollow gear, we know very well that if one moves, in fact, it has a spring. If you pull the spring, then the gear, suppose it is this coin, can go tangentially around the hollow gear and if we add a pointer, then the pointer goes forward, it stops, it goes backward a bit, then it restarts again forward, a bit backward, and so on. This is the epicycloidal motion of the planets. Or, for those of us that love mathematics, is a sort of Fourier series with two terms. And the same applies, the mathematics are the same, for the moon that gives variable velocity. And surprisingly enough, exactly the same mathematics are used today in many applications, including the way the telephone companies take our voice, make it bits and bytes, transmit it, and we have the opportunity to talk. But instead of having two terms, they use 32 terms. Well, OK. But it's the same principle, the same mathematics, really, that some of us love very much, as uh, you know. Another really surprise was that uh, the name of this thing, as we have a few descriptions at least, for most of the time, the people call it tablet. Of course, in Greek, it's pinakidion in Greek, which means little table. But it seems that humans select the same thing for the same object <laughs> over the millennia. And that was another surprise for us. Few words about the shipwreck that it was found. It was found on the Holy Week of 1900 in a small Greek island called Antikythera in a shipwreck that probably sunk sometime between 60 and 80 BC. These are the people that discovered it. They were on their way to Africa to collect sponges and this is Elias, the sponge diver who discovered it, and the captain, or the ship owner, in fact, of the ship. Here is the place of this little island. And it was in a huge shipwreck that probably is more than 60 meters long. And a bit more than 10 meters wide, or something like that. We are very lucky that the archaeologists continue, in fact, as we'll see. And they discovered there a very impressive philosopher of Antikythera, uh, the Antikythera youth, again, a very beautiful statue. And several sofas like this one, Louis XIV, perhaps, and um, of course, coins, and Muranos. Well, they are not Muranos, of course. They are very beautiful vases made of glass, as you can see, uh, mosaic type. And since then, they are in the National Archaeological Museum, Athens. As I said, the archaeologists continue because they have uh, a huge shipwreck, uh, the remains of it today are a conglomerate on the bed of the sea uh, with a thickness of the order of 50 centimeters up to one meter, 45 meters long and 
10 wild. And all this is a museum that is encapsulated in this conglomerate that is made of seaweeds, sea cells, and beautiful antiquities. So the archaeologists work, and I hope that one day we'll find some parts of the mechanism. Let's go back to the description. This is the moon, the sun. Here we have a map of the sky. It is the zodiac and a year, like the one we use today. And here we see some of the instructions. The instructions are written with very little, very small letters of the order of two millimeters or 2.2. And the same size is really the teeth of the gears, around two millimeters. The other side has this a spiral um, dial and a pointer that goes around inside this groove that we see here. And this is a Dorian, Doric calendar. Uh, it uh, belongs to a category that are called these calendars Corinthian and in particular, epirotic. Well, too technical. Anyway, we have exactly the same months in uh, Corfu and in northwestern Greece, including some cities that are now in um, Albania. When we read this, we understand quite well what one expects to see with the mechanism. And especially the motions of the planets. It tells you how many days it will go forward, this planet, Jupiter, let's say, how many days it, go, it will go backward, and so on. How many days it will be invisible, and so on, for all the five planets. And down here, we have the eclipses, as we said. And the dial of the Olympic Games. This is a very important instrument that we brought from uh, Tring near Oxford. This piece is almost nine tons in weight. And this is one section of the mechanism. It shows the wheel of the sun, probably here were the planets. We have up to now some uh, 30 one gears, but of course it had many more. One of them has the number 45. It's the gear of Jupiter, as I call it. We'll, we will see why. And uh, it's quite complicated, very well made. Uh, I suppose some of us have opened old clocks when we were children, playing with and we saw there some sort of uh, arcs like this that the specialists call safeties of the clock or of the watch. In fact, this machine has them there and uh, they keep safe the gears of the mechanism. These two gears and these two, four of them, are the ones that give variable ve velocity to the moon. So really they add two circular motions. And uh, between these two gears, two of them, that are parallel, there is what I call signature of the constructor. It is a pentagon, a pentacle, which is really the sign of the Pythagoreans. So there, the constructor says, I am a Pythagorean. What it really means. When I had the opportunity to give the first lecture to the physics students at the University of Athens, 
And I'm very glad that two of them are with us today. I mean, former students that I love. Uh, I, I used to say, you will become more Pythagoreans than Pythagoras himself. Well, of course, they were not in a position to understand, I suppose, none of them, what I really meant by this. But, uh, of course, I explain immediately and uh, I say, you will work all your life with mathematics. And Pythagoras is the first who said that nature can be only understood with the laws of physics that are expressed correctly with the appropriate mathematics. And in fact, this applies not only to physicists, but all scientists and uh, some medical doctors as well, of course, the engineers. This building, for example, has been built with mathematics, mainly. Not only, of course. <laughs> But uh, mainly the mathematics are the most uh, important ingredient in uh, uh, all today's applications. This screen shows this image, again using mathematics. The same, in fact, we use, they have used to construct uh, this mechanism with all the motions of uh, celestial bodies and the eclipses. So here we have the addition of the two circular motions. A few more of these images. These are the safeties that I have just mentioned before. More gears. And the construction is really immaculate. I don't know how we call this in English, probably gossips. Um, here you can see the pin that keeps this gear. And the most complicated part of the mechanism are the axis and the axles. Uh, we have a coaxial system, believe it or not, and the diameter of the outer one is of the order of three millimeters, really nothing. <coughs> now the chemistry or metallurgy, it is made of course of copper with a bit of tin that varies from 2% to 10%. The most complicated um, construction are in, in terms of, of metallurgy as well and uh, are the axis, as I said, and uh, it contains a bit of lead, especially for the gears, which is there for lubrication, as we used to have in our uh, cars still very recently. Here, let me present to you the way we have taken off the rust of the instrument without using anything else but mathematics and physics. We obtain 40 photographs, and then we combine these, math these mathematically using mainly the law of reflection that we have learned probably in the very early uh, years of the secondary school, if not in the primary. And uh, we have this miracle. We take off the rust just with mathematics. And that's how we have studied the surface. And here we have something very important. We are very lucky because this is the best preserved part of the mechanism. And here we have the laws of physics they use to predict the phases of the moon. Here it says, the phases of the moon have a periodicity of 76 years, a lunisolar one, and 19 years. And below, the eclipses are predicted 
using the periodicity of 223 months. And then it says something about ecliptic months during which we expect to have eclipses. Since I was a child, as I told you, I used to go to the museum, the archaeological museum in Athens, and admire all the beautiful things that are in uh, our uh, museum all around the, the world. And because, as I s said, perhaps mathematics was my uh, greatest love, let's say, it still is to an extent. Um, astronomy was my hobby, so I'm very lucky. I work doing my hobby. Uh, I had to stop at this machine that had a very attractive, to my mind, name. It was called Astrolab. Now, literally in Greek, this means an instrument that enables you to touch the stars. Well, it really means you can take the measurements of their position. But uh, <laughs> it's very important to have this name uh, for, I mean, it's a bit poetic if you like the name. And I had to stop there uh, when I was a child and look at it carefully, uh, see the gears, see the instructions a bit, although they were not as clear as we saw them before. And the very basic question, how on earth humans, 20-something centuries ago, could have astronomy without telescopes, let alone spacecraft, was a very basic one. But of course we know, and here we have this excellent um, statue that shows exactly how humans w worked at that time. You have uh, two rulers, one sliding perpendicular to the longer one. Of course there are numbers there. Sometimes they are directly um, um, numbered with trigonometric numbers or with degrees. A sort of variable triangle it is. And then you measure distances of celestial bodies or bodies on our planet. That's how they work, of course. And it was necessary for them, for people from prehistoric times, to have a sort of calendar. Their life had to follow the moon for hunting and fishing. And when they start agriculture, they have to follow the sun as well. So they had to count the number of days during the lunar month and during the year. And that's how astronomy started. And of course, they have constructions. Initially, they see features on the horizon. When the sun in my village rises over there, it start, it's time to start plowing, for example, and so on. Numbers come with them. And this is the beginning of civilization, Plato says. He says, we become humans. As we see the sky, we wonder. We want to understand what are these beautiful, bright things on the sky and why the sun moves like this and the lunar motion is uh, different and so on. And in our effort, this is my interpretation of him, regardless if we understand what they are, we become humans, we develop civilization. And so this is really the answer to this very basic uh, question that I had when I was 
a child. Of course, with it comes causality. The notion that uh, there are laws of physics, of physics that can only be expressed, as we said, with the appropriate mathematics. And according to Greek uh, history, I mean, to, to history, uh, Pythagoras was the very first one to say something like this. But I'm sure that prehistoric people already understood it, and that's how they have developed uh, whatever they have developed, including some uh, calendars. But it's very, uh, well, very nice to read in an ancient poem three words that say, celestial law that puts the star in their position and motion. Really incredible. And of course, uh, we have Minerva, Athena, if you prefer, that she was the goddess of knowledge, of science. And there are, of course, the disciplines, which are the eight muses. And Pythagoras, that says that uh, the laws of nature are mathematical. Something that, of course, this harpist here knew already from the fourth cent excuse me, fourth millennium, in fact, BC, to construct a, an art that gives pleasure with uh, the music. So, following these principles, somebody will discuss also the, who is probable father of the mechanism, constructs the mechanism uh, and um, the gears perform all the mathematical operations to predict the position of the moon, the phase, and so on. And that's how we have reconstructed the mechanism, like the one we have uh, in front of us. That's how they put the planet somewhere here. This is the gear of the sun. It has a diameter of the order of 13 centimeters. And again, here we see how we have studied this surface. These are the gears of the moon. This is the year, the solar year. Here we have the zodiac with the same names as we have today, with the exception of Libra and instructions. Instructions, these particular ones are on how to keep a proper calendar. For example, here it says, Iads set in the morning. So it is the 10th of October, let's say. And then Eagle, uh, sets at night, at night, then it's the 20th of October. Then Arcturus sets well, I cannot see very well anyway, <laughs> <laughs> and so on. We have uh, 40 of them, 40 lines of them. And an example of eclipses here. Here we read an eclipse of the moon, sigma, selini, aura, hour, nine. So during this month, of course, when we have full moon, we have an eclipse at nine o'clock. And incidentally, during the same month, we have an eclipse of the sun at nine o'clock. We had the opportunity to read properly the hour of 13 
solar eclipses. And I have given this data to a friend of mine who is a professor at the University of Uppsala, Jaren Herringson, uh, who is a specialist in ancient eclipses. And with this data, these 13 eclipses are spread in a period of 54 years and one month. He calculated where on earth they must have been observed. Now the answer is really thrilling. All of them in Syracuse. When? At the time of Archimedes. One third of them, of them before the death of Archimedes and the rest after. So this, if it is correct, and I believe it is, it really means that the grandfather of the mechanism is perhaps Archimedes and his students. And at that time, as we do today, in fact, we use the same term. When you send a new discovery to a journal, you call it a letter. Now, Archimedes, believe it or not, there are several letters of Archimedes that he has sent around, and more specifically to Eratosthenes. <laughs> really incredible that these things have survived. And in them, of course, we don't have the eclipses, but in some of them, obviously, they have sent the students of Archimedes this catalog, this table, tablet, perhaps comes from the table, uh, with the eclipses and then somebody else, presumably Hipparchus, because at the time this instrument has been constructed, the only or the most important Greek astronomer is Hipparchus. Uh, believed to be the most important Greek astronomer. Personally, I believe Archimedes was the most important astronomer. His father was an astronomer too. Uh, but we are a very small minority, the ones we believe that Archimedes was uh, the, the most important Greek uh, astronomer because very few things have survived. Well, here we have some radiographies. Here we have what I call uh, gearbox of the moon. Down there we have uh, the gear of Jupiter. The moon a bit uh, better here. It's a cylindrical or crown gear, as they are called. Oh, sorry. Here we have an axis. And this is the moon up there. This cylindrical gear turns and changes the phases of the moon during the month. While this display shows the calendar that is based on the phases of the moon. It is the one we use for Easter today. And here we have the Olympic Games. Again, these are the Olympic Games and other important Greek festivities. And as I said, it is an eight year period really, two times four. In fact, one of uh, four year period of 49 months and the other of 50. The eclipses. And the combination of two circles that are linked with this pin in a slot. A slot assumed to be a rectangular one by the rest of our group. I believe it is an ellipse and you will see why. So you really add a circular motion and an elliptical motion. So the result is really an ellipse. 
and uh, the Pythagorean pentagon here that I mentioned before that gives a good approximation of Kepler's second law with these gears. This is the pentagon. And even better here if you like. And now, this is the ellipse that I claim is there. Here we have the pin. It is a bit wider here, as you can see. The planets. This is a gear where we have uh, ME. We discovered it quite early. And uh, we even rank, ranked Mike Edmonds, and we told him, it has your initials on. <laughs> it's ME. It means 45. Uh, so probably it's the 45th uh, gear of, of the mechanism. Mm -hmm. And as we said, if we add, if we add a pointer, then it goes forward a bit, it stops, it goes back forward again, and so on, as we see here on this line that I have created. This is the 45. And if we measure this radius, and we divide it by the gap, the maximum gap between the inner uh, ring, excuse me, gear, and the outer gear, if we divide this by this gap, then we have the distance of this planet in astronomical units. It, and it comes out to be slightly larger than the one of Jupiter. But mind you, this is broken, so really this measurement is not very accurate. Below it, we have as you can see, a bimetallic uh, um, construction, a coil. Now, if this coil is linked to an axis that goes around once per year, the one of the sun, let's say, then it makes the planet go around for a few years. This was another surprise. Again, this is my own interpretation. The rest of, of the group is not prepared to accept it 100%. Um, here again, we have this 45. The, the number 45 appears in three places. On the gear and inside the box where this gear is contained. Uh, let me add the following, that uh, these rivets here are very small. This is only 2.2 millimeters. And the rivets are hollow. So you have very delicate construction. It is uh, more or less nanotechnology of that time. And here we have several sections of the same gear inside the box. <coughs> now, in ancient books of geometry mainly, of mathematics, we have a section concerning gears, how to design them and how to cut them. Uh, various types, even uh, with gears that are at an angle, not perpendicular, not parallel to the axis, I mean. And here we have a warm gear. This is the book of Papus. Various other constructions. And this is a quite complicated, you will agree, um, exercise for the student. Look how many gears they have for uh, the exercises. And this is a much more complicated, it comes from another book of Heron, Hero, sorry. And it is an automaton. 
we have here, as you can see quite well, a very complex construction. Now, back to the question of the clock. This is a design of Archimedes' clock to the right. The three different sections. Where we can see that we have a system of weights and a float and a water container and several automata. Now, the mechanism is much more complicated than this clock. And of course, if one has the most complicated uh, instrument of this time, one expects to have motion, that it was known to the constructors centuries before the construction of this one. I cannot imagine an archaeologist in 2,000 years uh, digging and uh, discovering, let's say, a Rolls Royce. And uh, the engine is missing. But they see that it has, I don't know what, let's say, everything that you can imagine, GPS, all the complex things one can have today or tomorrow, God knows what. But because there is no engine, the archaeologists say, well, this is really a cart and the humans have been pushing it behind, or perhaps there was a horse at the, <laughs> and so on. I mean, it, it is not really acceptable, it's not logical to believe that it was uh, just a thing that you could only put in time turning a knob. In fact, uh, in many books, like this one by Gallen, now, Galen is uh, an excellent medical doctor, of course. He has written very many books, but it seems that he was very good in mathematics and astronomy. And here he says that uh, we have clocks that are regulated by water. And as they go on, um, they predict the eclipses both of the of uh, both lunar and solar. Because he was a very good doctor and his books were very useful, they survived. The books of Archimedes did not. Why? If something contains mathematics, the copyist is not interested to copy it. And uh, I had the opportunity to handle uh, several books that were not, uh, well, some of the handwritten, handwritten ones uh, that were not uh, finalized. They were astronomical. And the parts of the mathematics and the parts of the drawings were missing. Why? Because it was difficult for the copies to make them. So they, made, they, they, they did not survive the books that had complicated mathematics. So here we have this system with a float, I repeat it. The water goes up and the float changes the position of the weight and the counterweight. We already mentioned Archimedes as possible grandfather of the mechanism. But as Hipparchus is the one that uh, is the greatest astronomy of the time, perhaps he is the father. Um, I repeat that we also have this spiral. It is a simple Archimedes spiral constructed with two centers. 
And we have this from a book by Archimedes. And the same we have in the mechanism. But Hipparchus, who was for many years, for many decades, for most of his life, working at Rhodes, and there we have very good craftsmen, uh, very good metallurgists. Perhaps he is the one that uh, created this machine. Where we expect uh, uh, to use this type of instruments? Well, of course, in astronomical schools, in philosophical schools, uh, we have the calendars that are very useful for rulers. And you have prediction of astronomical phenomena that can impress their friends of the rulers and, even more important, their enemies. And, of course, a very rich person can have a royal tablet, as we read in the books. We have inexpensive tablets made of wood, they say, more expensive made of copper, and even royal tablets made of gold, ivory, ebony, and even diamonds, they read in this, uh, we read in these uh, books. Of course, it is a meteorological and climatological instrument. And that was the reason humans developed calendars, after all. So, this is a very important component. It regulates their life, but I believe one can use it easily to measure the latitude. This is very easy. And longitude, then cartography. How you can use it to measure longitude? If we read the book of Ptolemy, let's say, the geography of Ptolemy, we have there 20,000 cities or places with coordinates. Now, if we compare some of them, let's say we take all the cities in Spain and compare them with the present-day correct longitudes and latitudes, for every region, we have a systematic or quasi-systematic error. Now, it is believed that uh, this has been measured by obtaining measurements during lunar eclipses. But to have 20,000 places with longitude especially, um, up to China, it's really impossible to have 20,000 uh, well-educated uh, and capable people to measure the position of the moon and so on. Instead, if you have such a machine, together with a good table of the motion of the moon, let's say, then you can work out to, to, to an extent the longitude. If you set it up properly, when you say, let's say, from this port to the next one, and so on. Well, this is a possibility. But we have the ge geography with 20,000 places. Of course, it can be used for navigation, and no doubt by the military, and exploration. Other mechanisms? Yes. Well, this is a pocket mechanism that one can use uh, to keep a calendar. It is of the 18th century BC, or around that. And this is a mold. So they could pour copper in it and create 
a few at least. So there was a market. Then we have simple clocks like this one. It works again by, with a combination of uh, water and, and uh, weights. Another automata, this is from a little automatic theater. And various clocks, this one is with sand. The other one is with weights and counterweights. Oh, again, this is a, excuse me, it is a, an automaton. And in France, they discovered this thing, which is uh, of the order of eight centimeters. It has the zodiac exactly the same as the mechanism. It has the months of, of the mechanism and also the months we, we, we use today. We read August, uh, September, October, November, December, and so on. Oh, this was probably made around 230, 230 AD, not BC that I have there. And it was found in France. And another one that you can admire at the Science Museum in South Kensington, uh, which again is much simpler. And this is a famous clock of uh, Gaza, where you have a building that has several doors, and Hercules goes every hour and opens a new one and you know that if it is the lion, it is one o'clock, and so on. And then we have uh, Al Biruni. Uh, this is very similar to the Gaza clock. The Gaza clock, of course, was Greek, a Greek clock. This is an Islamic uh, uh, clock uh, by Al Saati described who describes the clock of al Zazari, And it is based on Archimedes' clock, the books say. The Astrarium of uh, the Dondi. This is a copy from Paris. And various other things. This is a surprise. Three wooden ones constructed probably around 1780 that I have discovered at the National Archaeological Museum of Iceland. Dennis, and other clocks that we are familiar with. And I think uh, with all these, we are familiar with the mechanism. And of course, it is time for uh, perhaps some Questions, comments also. And thank you very much for. Thank you. Thank you.